Okay, so I think we're ready to begin. Um, we'll start with, we have from left to right, Adam, Jeff, Jeff, and Mary. So I will let you guys formally <laughs> introduce yourselves. Um, so we'll get started by getting you to tell us about yourself, your positions, and the companies that you work for. And we'll start with you, Adam. Uh, my name is Adam Bauer. I'm presently the uh, Assistant General Manager and Director in Sales and Marketing of the Halifax Club. It, those of you who don't know about the Halifax Club, it's a private business and social club downtown Halifax. It's been there 151 years, so I look after operations there and, and uh, sales and, and uh, marketing initiatives. Previously to that, I was with uh, Delta Hotels for six years managing food and beverage at the Delta Halifax and Delta Barrington. And uh, before that, with Fairmont Hotels and Resorts for four years. So I've been in the hospitality industry for 16 years now, 11 of those being in management. Um, went to Mount St. Vincent just like yourself. I graduated from this program in 2003 and uh, went out to Alberta four years and uh, moved back to Halifax and been here ever since. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Gray. I'm the Curator of Marketing and Communications at the Museum of Natural History. I'm also acting in that role at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, and I also work uh, in the larger Department of Communities, Culture, and Heritage with the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, I've been in this role since 2009, and prior to that, for eight and a half years, is at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, also doing marketing and communications uh, at their site, and have been largely with the museum world since 2000, uh, 2001, uh, when I graduated from this program as well. Uh, Prior, and I guess I've been in the hospitality industry well, forever, since dinosaurs roamed the earth. And so uh, I have only good things to say about the program and, and better things to say about the industry. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jeff Ransom. I'm the general manager for the Halifax Merritt Harbor Front Hotel. Um, and this was a great reason to get out of the hotel because they're doing some jackhammering today. So <laughs> thank you very much for having me here. Um, I work for Marriott Hotels of Canada, which, work, which reports to Marriott Hotels International. I've been with them for 15 years, uh, holding various positions at different hotels throughout Ontario and Nova Scotia. And uh, that's all I do. <laughs> I mean, uh, just quickly, uh, just to understand the role a little bit, um, you know, I have oversight for all of the operations that take place within the hotel. I'm a director of sales and marketing, director of human resources, director of uh, operations, engineering and finance that report to me. That's it. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Mary Dempster and I'm the Chief uh, Operating Officer for Ambassadors Grey Line. And Ambassadors Grey Line is a company that has those pink buses. So if you've seen the pink buses, that's uh, uh, many of our buses have turned pink and if uh, the opportunity comes up, I'll explain that later. Um, I um, have only been with the company for about a year. Prior to that, I've been in the hotel business for some 26 years, and uh, my last 10 years I spent at Delta Barrington, Delta Halifax, managing the two properties. And uh, then I went off to teach at the community college, a program similar to this, and uh, was there for three years and then decided to go back into industry, back into business. And so that's what's landed me at Ambassador's Grey Line. Excellent, thank you. So next, what experiences and or opportunities have you had that encouraged you to pursue a career in the tourism and hospitality industry? And maybe Jeff Gray, we'll start with you. Um, I think, I feel like I'm very lucky. I, I had, had always wanted to sort of work in the museum world. I mm -hmm. had really wanted to, uh, to do that ever since I was little. and. It's one of those strange industries to get into. You either go in on the, the uh, teach and learn and collecting side of the educational side, or you go in on the other side. And, and I've always enjoyed people and sort of wanted to go that route. Um, I, they laugh at me now because for years I applied for jobs at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic and could never get in because I didn't have the right background or the right education. And then I finally ended up working there sort of backwards. And it was kind of funny that and they like to make fun of me for it. But I, I worked in restaurants, I worked in a variety of, uh, of jobs, hoping that I would eventually get back into the museum world. And I, I would say that I'd, I'd like to think that part of it was going through this program and having 
sort of a more formalized education that finally sort of got me in the door. And I honestly worked at the museum, the Maritime Museum. I finally got there. I worked there for less than a year and went to the art gallery for what was going to be four months. And uh, it, was just, it just kept lasting and lasting. And eight and a half years later, I, I left there to go to a different museum. And then for five months ago, I'm, I'm back at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic helping out for quite ironically a uh, parental leave, which was the same reason I left there in the first place. So uh, the moral of that story is that parental leaves can be a good opportunity for moving <laughs> around and trying new things, and that's actually true. Um, and, and also I think that if you, you know what you want to do and you have an interest in something, that, that be tenacious and, and keep pushing for it, and, and those opportunities will come to you. Great. Okay. Uh, Jeff? Uh, so I guess I, I kind of fell into this uh, industry. I mean, I really, <laughs> I started out uh, in high school just working at a restaurant part-time. That was something that uh, was helping to put a few, mu a few dollars in the pocket. And uh, through that experience, I actually fell in love with the culinary arts. So I became an, a chef for probably the first 18, 19 years of my career. I know it seems like just yesterday, but uh, 18 or 19 years of that. And then after uh, working through different companies, so I had worked at Delta for a period of time, I worked for CP, I worked for Hilton, I then moved uh, into Marriott, and, uh, and that was the first time I explored going out in front, you know, working in the restaurants, um, getting experience with direct customer-facing uh, opportunities. Um, I would say that I've been fortunate, both Delta and Marriott provided me with great opportunities to uh, grow beyond what I had originally set out to do. Um, I found that was important to me. I'd worked for a variety of different companies that I think had a bit more of a the viewpoint that once you've uh, taken a career path, that's the only career path you can have. Um, so I enjoyed the opportunity of working for companies that looked at it more broadly. Um, I, I then kind of went out and became a director of operations for a hotel and, and finally firstly a general manager at the Renaissance in Niagara Falls. So those were some of the steps. I would say that you know, the one thing that I think is really important was I was willing to be patient for my opportunities and I also had a bit of luck on my side because sometimes that's what you need in order to get that next level. Um, so those are really what, what got me into this career and got me to the place where I am today. Great, thank you. Mary? Well, I, like Jeff, fell into it. Um, I am a, a trained paralegal and um, w ended up getting fired from my first job. <laughs> Go figure. So I decided at uh, the rare, um, the ripe age of uh, 20s, uh, early 20s that, uh, you know what, if they didn't want me, I didn't want them either. So I was going to go and do something else. And I ended up not being able to find or figure out what that something else was. So I um, ended up getting a job uh, managing a, um, an engineering company, um, just the secretarial pool. So I was the office manager. And uh, from there, um, we were merging two offices together. And uh, so half the group was going to be out of work. So in the morning when the newspaper arrived, it was like, you know, you'd almost get attacked to get to, to the newspaper. Keep in mind, there was no internet back then. And uh, that's how we looked for a job, was on, in the newspaper. So um, this newspaper came. And unbeknownst to me, some of my staff members saw a perfect job for me except for they forgot to tell me. So they called and interviewed, telephone interviewed, as if they were me. And I got the interview. And then they had to come and explain to me that I had the interview. And so back in those days, general managers were the most important people in the whole world. So I felt I couldn't just pick up the phone and explain to the general manager at the Lord Nelson that there had been a terrible mistake and that I really hadn't applied for the job and that it was the staff. So I uh, went down in person and this general manager was um, um, less than pleased, let's just put it that way. In fact, he was downright rude. And I remember saying to the PR girl, it's a good thing I'm not looking for a job because this guy's an ass. <laughs> and I left after I made my apologies, which I thought were the right thing to do, and I left. The next day, the phone rang at my desk and I picked up the phone, and the voice on the other end of the phone said, Mr. Corso, 2 o'clock, my office. <laughs> Down went the phone. And I thought, all right, you really are an ass. But what was I to do? I couldn't very well not go and have a conversation with him. I couldn't just ignore him. Again, general managers are the most important people <laughs> in the whole world. We like to think that. <laughs> 
So off I went and got to the lobby and there was the human resource gal and no general manager to be seen. And so as I walked towards her, he came scooting down the stairs of the Lord Nelson and he said, come with me. And I looked over at her and he out the front door of the Lord Nelson. For anybody who knows where the Lord Nelson is, across the street is the public gardens. So we marched across the street to the public gardens and I thought, oh my God, they're going to kill me. That's what they're <laughs> going to do. They're going to kill me right here. So we walked together and he dropped back because he was in the lead, like general managers do. And he dropped back and said, <laughs> he dropped back and he said, so, you think I'm an ass? And I turned and I looked over at that human resources girl and I'll never forget the look on her face. And I thought, oh boy, he's found me out now. He said, well, that's good. He said, I, I like somebody who, who shows that they, they say what they mean. And I said, well, sir, I could never work for you. He said, really? He said, you will work for me. <laughs> and I looked at him and he said, how much do you make? And I thought about it and I made, now keep your socks on here, $9,600 a year. And so I said, $9,800. I was going to get something. He said, I'll double it. And I sat back, stood back for a second, and the human resources girl kind of looked at me. And I looked over at her, and he said, and you can live in, no expenses. I said, everybody can be bought. I learned more from Joe Corso in the four and a half years that I worked for him than any other person. He was my mentor and he is to this day. He was one of the best general managers I have ever experienced and that's what got me into this business. I then left after he left, he went back to the United States and uh, I left and uh, went down to the Sheraton which is now the Halifax Marriott Harborfront Hotel and um, I was on the pre-opening team, which was a lot of fun, and uh, was there for five years, and then decided, that's it, I'm, I'm gonna get out of the business. Time to move on, do something else. 24-7 was just a little more than I could, even I could stand after 10 years. And uh, my buddy up at the CP Hotel, which is now the Delta Halifax, said, Mary, could you just come up and help me out? I know you don't wanna stay in the business, just help me out. I said, sure. After a year, I signed my contract because, of course, that help became a whole year's worth of work, and then I was there for 21 years. So 21 years, uh, we bought Delta Hotels. The last 10 years of my uh, career, I ended up being able to um, uh, manage the two hotels, became the general manager that I thought everybody should be and uh, was the general manager for, for the last 10. And then I left and went to teach for the three years at the Nova Scotia Community College. Missed being in industry, missed being um, part of a, a, of, a, of a business with all its financial woes and challenges. And then just this year went to work for ambassadors. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mary. Now, Adam. So uh, I'm from uh, Lunenburg originally and it's Lunenburg um, I grew up there and moved around a lot, but we always came back. I grew up in a 200-year-old home, and you know, everything in Lunenburg was pretty old. And when I was growing up there, I didn't really appreciate uh, what my surroundings, what, where I lived. Um, I, had no, I was going to high school there. I had, was going into my last year, and I had no clue what I wanted to do when I graduated. I knew I wanted to go to university or college, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, I worked one summer before that last year at uh, Tea House in Mohon Bay. And I had never, I didn't have a full-time job before in my life. I had odd jobs here and there. And as my friend used to wash dishes there, and he got me a job at the TOS washing dishes. And I was only washing dishes for about two weeks when the owner asked me if I would like to serve tables. She saw that I was out talking to the guests when I was out clearing tables, and she saw I was interactive. And uh, so she, uh, <laughs> she uh, wanted to know if I wanted to become her server. And so I thought, well, if you get more tip money, sure, I'll become a server. So I did that for the summer, and when I was going into my last year, I realized that why people came to Lunenburg. Uh, I got to talk to people from all around the world, and I appreciated what they came there for. I appreciated where I lived. I enjoyed talking to people about where I'm from, and I became really passionate about Nova Scotia and Lunenburg and what we have here. And so that's kind of what got me interested in, 
in uh, coming into the hospitality industry. Uh, I spoke to my guidance counselor and asked her, you know, what can I do with this? And she mentioned Mount St. Vincent University as a program. So I had no clue and that's what led me here. Um, I had served for a couple work terms and my last work term, I got to go back to Lunenburg, uh, the Grand Banker, where I had um, served for a few years and I got an assistant manager job on my last work term there. Uh, I didn't even apply for one. He just asked me if I wanted to be the assistant manager when I went back to serve there. So that gave me some management experience um, along with the degree that I was earning here. And you know, the degree really prepared me for what I was to, about to face in the industry. Um, after university, I applied to Fairmont Hotels and Resorts and I got a job out working there as the uh, assistant food and beverage manager for a couple of the restaurants. And while on a resort out there, I definitely recommend if anyone has a chance to have some resort experience, uh, you really get, it's, it's second to none. Uh, while I was out there, I got to work in eight different restaurants. I got to manage banquets for up to 800 people, you know, interim dining. I got to serve the Queen of England when she came out there. Uh, just the experience I got there in four years, you know, you could move around for years and years, 10 years plus to get that experience anywhere else. And I was uh, actually uh, looking to move back to Nova Scotia after I'd been there for four years. I, I missed Yoshin, I missed Halifax, and I, I, uh, I found myself, even though I was in Alberta, I was talking to a lot of the guests about what they could come to Nova Scotia to see. And uh, <laughs> they were in there, there in Alberta to experience that, but I was you know, still talking about Nova Scotia. It's uh, why I love being in the industry, talking about what we have here to offer. And actually, Mary Dempster was uh, coming out to Jasper for the TIAC conference. And with my ties, I still had to Mount St. Vincent, the cooperative education manager, she actually told me Mary was gonna be out there. And I don't know if I ever told Mary how I knew she was coming, but <laughs> I get a little heads up. So I was able to meet with Mary and uh, there was an opening for an outlets manager back in Halifax, at the Delta Halifax and Delta Barrington. So uh, Mary's the reason I was able to come back to Nova Scotia. And I uh, was there for four years in numerous positions you know, managing the outlets, managing banquets, um, outside catering. We, uh, while I was there, we started all the catering for Tall Ship Silva. We did all the food and board the boat. We did Citadel Hill Fort, uh, concerts, you know, Paul McCartney, Kiss, all these big concerts, 30, 40,000 people. I mean, uh, it's a lot more experience in it than you'd expect to get in just a hotel. So I did that for uh, four, five, I guess five and a half years. And recently, last October, like I said, I went down to the Halifax Club and now I'm able to take all that operational expertise that I had from Fairmont and Delta and bring that to, uh, to this private club. And also I can focus more on sales and marketing now than I did before and step back a little bit from the actual operations, which is a nice uh, mix for me now and good, good growth for me at the moment. Uh, also, uh, I was uh, able to get my sommelier uh, while I was with Delta, which has been a big asset to me too. That's really helped me at the Halifax Club where we do a lot of wine dinners and we do a lot of hosting of events and tastings and, uh, and educate my staff. So those are kind of what uh, got me into the industry and why I am where I am today. Excellent. Thank you so much. So it seems that everybody has kind of fell into the field in one way or another. So that kind of takes care of my next question. Um, if, if maybe you could all touch on your education background on, and or training that is, that is also led you along the, the path through tourism and hospitality. And uh, Jeff Ransom, we'll start with you. Very good. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I, my first foray into things was uh, culinary. So I actually uh, took an apprenticeship. And that's how I started out in the culinary field. And um, you know, through different courses that I could take while I was actually working, I was able to kind of build on my portfolio of knowledge. And, and you know, doing an apprenticeship meant that I was working for different chefs in different locations. Uh, I worked in Portugal and Spain. I worked in Mexico for a while as well on the, on the cruise lines for Carnival. Um, and then kind of when I felt I'd gotten to a place where I'd somewhat mastered the field, I, uh, I joined Delta and I was uh, the executive chef at one of the properties for a few years. So that was my first uh, educational step. The second thing that I did, and I don't know why I did this, but I guess when I was in my early 20s, I, I was kind of looking around and thinking to myself, I don't know if this is something I can do for my whole life. I didn't know if this was uh, something that really was going to be around. There's a lot of things that you, you know, from that side of the glass window, you can see a lot of pre-prepared foods were starting to come out and all that stuff. So I, I decided to go back to school I, and uh, take hotel and restaurant management. So I wanted to get that under my belt. And then most recently, 
the last thing that I've done is I was down there, there was a couple of work experiences, or, or, or sorry, educational experiences that were put together um, through, and I'm going to say it was through tie-ins with Cornell University, so I was down there, and, I, and at this point in my career, I was kind of looking at the asset management side of things, so I was able to take a course there and, and get a, you know, a, a, I don't know what they call it, certificate for asset management. So, so those are kind of the various steps throughout, you know, my career. Just, uh, you, you know, I've always managed to say to myself, look, there's got to be something in it for me each year as far as what I'm going to do to develop myself and what I'm going to do to educate myself. We have uh, professional development plans that we expect people to kind of follow through in, in my organization. But beyond that, you know, there's just that kind of constant search for additional knowledge. So I have taken f a few different courses on leadership, um, strategy, uh, human resources over the course of time as well. So that's kind of how I put it together. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Mary? Um, well, as I mentioned, I um, started out as a paralegal, um, so my education really had nothing to do with tourism and hospitality. Um, I was sort of educated on the fly, if you will, taking uh, absolute advantage. If somebody asked me to do something, I said yes. Before they could even get it out of their mouth, I said yes. So I ended up doing a lot of bizarre things, I have to tell you. But the fact is, is that all those things gave me the education to keep moving throughout our industry. And I started out as a server, and then I, they said, would you go on the front desk? What did I know about that? Oh, well, I'll try it, you know. So I went from there. I actually uh, did, um, you know, the switchboard. I did, I parked cars. I, anything that, that somebody asked me to do, I did. And then eventually, um, I was able to start moving into management positions, and I became a director of catering, and then a director of sales, and then a director of operations, and then eventually the general manager of one hotel, and then of the two. So, you know, my, my courses, as Jeff has said, you know, every year you have to take responsibility for your own education when you do get uh, into the business world, because quite honestly, the business world is 365 days that go just like that, and the next thing you know, you're into the next year. And what have you done? What have you done for you? And so it's really important that you look for opportunities to take courses. They don't all have to be in, in the area in which you work, but if you know that you're not great in finance, I knew I was not great in finance. I knew that if I was going to be a general manager someday, I'd need to get that. So I started taking finance courses. I am, you know, I'm very lucky to say that I have 14 credits here at the Mount. I haven't finished a degree, but I have 14 credits because I just keep chipping away at more education, more thought-provoking ways in, in order to use the experiences that I've had to help me be a better me for my company, but also for me. And I think Jeff's point is very, very well taken. Take charge of your own education, your own personal development. What did you learn today that's going to make you better for tomorrow and the day after and the day after? And so that's how I've treated my education. I've got an NSCC degree, 14 credits, a couple of Cornell certificates, but that's it. I have actually not amassed anything like a PhD or anything like that. or. Um, all the great things that you can do in education, um, but I really do believe that uh, uh, the experience that I've had and that education together have made me what I am today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary. Adam? Uh, for myself, uh, it's a combination uh, from, that worked for me with, uh, you know, the industry experience starting out, the degree here, uh, the cooperative education experience was proved to be a huge thing for me. Um, having some supervisory experience even before I graduated or if you can get it, you know, shortly thereafter, um, that, that, that's what landed me the job with Fairmont. You know, they told me straight out, you know, we, we don't usually hire, hire someone in this position straight out of university, but if you, you have some supervisory experience as well too, that's why they, uh, they put me right in that position. And then, same as the others spoke on, it was uh, an eagerness throughout my career to take on and learn whatever I could any training that was offered. If I could be cross-trained to management banquets when I was working in the outlets, you know, some didn't want to do that because it meant that they were going to end up working more hours. Well, if you're looking for the longevity, longevity of your career and looking down the road, um, you're going to want to take that on. It's uh, when someone needs to be cross-trained to uh, program the point-of-sale system for the whole resort. You know, that was almost another job in itself, but I, I uh, asked to take that on. It's just uh, makes you more diverse in your, your skills. 
and it's going to help you when you prepare for your next position that you're applying for. Everybody's already said the good stuff. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm just thinking back to the question about you know, experiences here. I, I cannot say enough about my co-op time that I had here at the Mount. And I would pretty much hold my co-op time up to anyone who's ever <laughs> gone to the Mount. I mean, I had unbelievable opportunities. I worked for Via Rail, uh, which was, you know, I mean, I made 16 trips to Montreal <laughs> one summer, which in a, you know, building that's no wider than this table, <laughs> you rock it back and forth. Um, but you meet a lot of people, you get to do a lot of interesting things. I got to go to Disney World and worked at, uh, at Epcot for uh, six months. You know, I had roommates from around the world and, and just was exposed to a massive organization and how it does things. But people get caught up in the size of it, but at the end of the day, the, what they do at the front line and that interface with their visitors, I mean, you know, that works today for what I do in my job now. And, and then I went to ACOA and worked for six months at ACOA and really saw government, government funding, and was exposed to a lot of people and opportunities in the industry. I mean, for me, that was huge. And then to echo something that, that Mary said, you know, as soon as I got out into sort of the real world and had like a real job, it was, to me, it, was, it would have been easy to coast for a bit, but I just basically took the mantra that this, this is not the time to ever say no. And if people say, can you do this? Then I said, yes, I can do that. Even if I didn't know how to do that, I was going to be like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, and it's actually, you know, that's how I'm, I mean, I'm really now responsible for the public relations side of, of two of the biggest museums in the province. And I have no, I shouldn't even say this at the Mount, but I have no <laughs> public relations training at all. And everybody assumes, oh, you went to the Mount, you took public relations. I'm like, no, I did not. But the thing was, they didn't have anybody. The person left, and they weren't hiring anyone. And so they said, well, you can do some of that. And I said, yes, I can do that. And, you know, I am not overly excited about being filmed right now as I sit here but yet I'm always on TV for the museum and you know and have played with Cyril Lunny on breakfast television and done crazy things that I wouldn't want to do but you do it because you know that it's it's good for it's good for where I work but it's also good for me and it was good opportunities and I think that I think that early on when you gain a lot of experience early on and to echo what Adam was saying too that you know, they see that you have supervisor experience, which I took every opportunity to get that. You take a leadership role on leading projects. Those things resonate with people when they ask you those questions in, in interviews and you have really interesting and good examples of real concrete things that you've done. I think getting those experiences early on are really important. Great, thank you. And so just a question about your co-op for all of the co-op students out there. Did you seek those? experiences or were those job opportunities that were offered? They were all, in my case, and I'm not sure exactly how it works now, but they were all ones that came They were all ones that here. came, okay. At the time, I have no idea how they're doing it now, but yeah. at the time, uh, Disney was doing two recruiting trips to Canada, mm -hmm. and at that time, they came here to the Mount uh, as one of their, actually their only East Coast stop. Excellent. Um, cool. The VIA job, <laughs> the, also the reason by saying you'll do anything, the VIA job uh, after I got the job, stopped being a job because it was in it was uh, in conflict with the union agreement that the job that I was hired to do couldn't actually happen. So the job had to be taken away from me, and then uh, they had to offer that job out to somebody else. But when that person left to take what would have been my summer job, they had a hole that needed to be filled on the back end. And since they had already agreed to hire me, I got to do that. But a lot of people could have said, you know, no, I'm going to go do it. I could have, you know, one of the other jobs on the list, I may have been able to do that. But I was willing to do what arguably was the lesser job than what I would have had to do. But I think in the long run, I got the better experience because, uh, you know, it's important to have a job that is hard and that you, at times, don't like. <laughs> and, that, and also, for me, the exposure to what is a very highly unionized environment was a really interesting opportunity. So, I mean, I think at some points, you know, there are a lot of crappy jobs out there, and I think that it's important to suck some of them up to get that experience so that, one, when you look back on it, you can remember the things that you hated. When you're in a position to make that better for someone, you will have that experience, which I think is important. And two, I mean, it also helps form what you like and what you don't like and, and what it is about that job that made it terrible. If you understand those things about you, I think that goes a long way to helping you years down the road. My, my first uh, co-op position 
I, I sought out myself. I, uh, it was a restaurant that I had worked before and I wanted to return back to Lundeberg to work there. Uh, my second one was a posting that was uh, Murphy's on the Water. So then I got to work at a larger size operation in a bigger restaurant, bigger environment, faster paced. And my third one, uh, I saw it back at the Grand Banker. Uh, I went back there and I said, I worked here my first work term. I can only come back here if you give me a bit more experience, or a bit more uh, supervisory experience. And then they offered me the assistant manager role, so that was a position Great. I uh, came up for myself. So. Excellent, thank you. Kind of on the same note, are there certain skills, attributes, or training that you would suggest students have upon entering the tourism and hospitality field? I know that you just, most all of you said a willingness to learn and to take on any job. So if you can just add to that, maybe start with you, Mary. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is the skill, and I call it a skill, um, and it's, a, it's hard to get, but um, it is attainable, and that is the skill of problem solving. It's being able to take a, and look at something and be able to figure out what is the next best step to moving this issue or this problem or this item forward. And so often when we lack experience, because we haven't been in the workplace, we think that we hate, lack problem solving skills, but we don't. Because every day you're solving problems. They may not be tourism and hospitality problems, they may not be server problems or front desk problems or, or tour problems or whatever the case may be, but you're solving problems every day. And it's part of the, the idea of, of understanding the value of being where you are today and how you've gotten here. It's taking all of the obstacles that were put in your way to be coming to university, to getting your own place, to dealing with roommates, to dealing with having no money, to wanting to go out and don't have en enough resources or no way to get there or whatever your issue is. But you are solving problems. And if there's any skill that you could use in the, in the working world, and that is, is to look at things and try and figure out what's the next best step? What's the next thing I need to do? Don't give up, push through, and solve the problem. Because you didn't get here today because you couldn't solve problems. So you have that skill, just you need to practice it. It's like piano, you know, you gotta do it all the time. Um, I would say uh, when you're in uh, some of your co-op roles especially and you're, you're in some of the entry-level positions in the industry, whether it be serving or front desk or tour guide, you name it, uh, just uh, be that one in your team that's dependable, that your supervisor knows if they need someone to stay later, you're going to help them out. If there's a sick call, you're going to be there. Uh, when they have a VIP group in, you're the, you're the dependable one, you're the reliable one that's going to follow through and you're gonna hit all the standards and give the best guest service. Um, I've seen people on uh, co-ops before in work terms that, you know, uh, they're the first ones that wanna leave when the ship's over or, you know, they're, they're not picking up any of the sick calls and I always wonder, you know, these are people that wanna move forward in this industry and really make an impression. You know, make that impression because you never know where it's gonna take you and it is a very, very small industry and you wanna make sure that all your positions have a good impact and really reflect who you wanna be and where you want to go. Um, I mean, uh, it's uh, one of those things that, you know, you can show leadership in your position. Even though you're maybe at an entry level, you can be the one that's going to take the lead on things, and they can see you in that light when that position is open down the road. So uh, just always keep that in mind. I mean, there's other people that are going to be working with you that aren't in this for a career. They're just in there to make money. You're in there for different reasons. So set yourself aside and apart from them. Great. Thank you. Jeff? Um, I think one of the big things is understanding uh, how groups work. I think I used to think back on my time, especially here at the Mountain, there used to be, I mean, probably still the same, a lot of group work. And I used to just think, oh, God, another group. God, I hate this group. And just, why won't that person show up? They never do their work. Why is this, why is this happening to me? And I don't want to be in that person's group again. And you, you, know, you get into another class the next year, and that same person is in your class. And you sit on the other side of the room hoping they're not in your group. And the sad reality of it is that is going to follow you your entire life. It just is ongoing. There is always going to be someone you work with who does not work as hard, someone who is sick a lot, someone who doesn't carry their weight. I mean, that is a reality, and you need to work through that. And 
you know, the other side, side of it, there is no professor to go to to say, hey, I can't work. You know, you can go to that, but the work still has to get done. And, and, and then the worst part is that, the, you know, the class doesn't end and you move on. Work keeps happening. It just keeps going on and that needs to, you know, you need to understand how that works. You need to do your work, and I echo your comment. I mean, you need to put in the effort, stand out, and, and do a good job and find out how to push through. But understanding that the group thing is always going to be with you and, and understanding how to function in that environment and how to stand out in that environment, I think is one of the most important things that you can learn now. And I think if I could, can talk to like 1999 or 2000 Jeff and tell him like, <laughs> it's gonna be like this always. That's what groups are, it's work. Um, I think that's a key to take away from your time now and, and learn how to use that later on. Yeah, it is tough going last, actually, now I realize that. <laughs> um, you know, I guess I always look at things that people bring to the table in two different uh, categories. So one are the hard technical skills that somebody brings to the table. You know, how well do you know your job, the functions of it, the math of the financials, the, those kind of skills. And then the other is really attitudinal. And, and for me, you know, when I think of everything that we're saying today, you know, I, I really feel like you can tell when somebody brings the attitude to the table. You can tell whether or not there's a sincere interest or whether you're just playing along. You can tell who's going to be very successful, frankly, the first day they walk in the job and they help somebody with the door. It doesn't have to be any more technical than that. It doesn't have to be any more, you know, skilled than that. It's just simply whether or not they have it or they don't. And everyone has it. It is about a choice that you have to make, decisions that you have to make to decide to bring that game, to decide to perform. You know, and, and I find that you know, oftentimes the limiting factor really is um, whether or not people have made that decision and have really decided to put everything into it. So that's, you know, for me, that's the one thing that I look at when I'm you know, not, not interviewing, interviewing so much, but deciding whether or not they're part of our culture, the part of our fabric for the first 90 days, is whether or not they bring that attitude with them. So choose your attitude. Great, thank you. Kind of on a side note from that question, are there certain organizations or committees or places that students should have their eyes or and be involved in while they're while they're in school? I mean, for me, I, I don't know if I would specify any one organization. Right. Frankly, being involved in an organization of okay. any kind is probably helpful. I mean, anywhere where you're kind of putting yourself in the position where. You know, it's not necessarily going to go entirely the way you want it to, but you're going to have to work with a group of people in order to move something forward. I think that's good. I mean, really, it's, it's you're contributing in some way, hopefully in a major way, but you're contributing in some way. I think that's important. And you're also going to take away a variety of different viewpoints that you otherwise would never have heard or seen. So I wouldn't say there's one organization. I would just say, you know, be, be a part of something. And if I can just add to that, Jeff, it doesn't have to be hospitality and tourism. We're not talking about tie-ins or hotel associations or, you know, Meeting Planners International, all those kinds of things that are available to tourism people. But, you know, go and do something for a, you know, a hockey club or a gymnastics group or, you know, a study group for people learning, you know, how to play Monopoly. I don't care what it is. But Jeff's absolutely right. Get involved with a group of people, the, the two Jeffs, uh, get involved <laughs> with a group of people that will help you see that there's another way of looking at things that is very different than your way of looking at it. And that'll help you grow. And you, you'll bring that skill that you bring to that table. Even if it's lo, you know Lego, you'll bring a skill back to whoever your employer is because you've been able to take and help move a group forward to raise funds or get better at whatever it is that they do. Great. And Jeff and Adam, did you have anything to add to that? No, they took the good no. stuff. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I, just to echo their point, I think, and, and you kind of alluded to it, other Jeff, when you said um, if you are using two, your two points together, that if you are a part of another group that is apart from your strict work and education background, if you find yourself in an interview, it might be a way to steer a question uh, and, an, and a response to that question away from, and when I worked here, I did this, and when I worked here, I did this. If you can say something else than that, it, it might just tweak the person who's interviewing to make you a little bit more memorable and your experience a little more rich than somebody else. So I think that there is a lot of value in, mm -hmm. and I agree that I don't think it, it 
I mean, it's beneficial too right. if it is something tourism. Mm -hmm. But I think just getting involved in anything that is extracurricular that allows you to get more experience, I think, is great. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, just the only thing I have to add to what they say. I mean, uh, with, when you're with an employer for a co-op, you know, even if there are any kinds of groups within the organization, you can be involved. And if there's an opportunity to be part of a health and wellness committee or a green committee or you know an internal committee within the company you're working for, that's just something extra you can take on while you're you're doing a work term too. So that's something always worth checking out and you can add to your resume. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And what is it about the tourism and hospitality industry that you absolutely love? <laughs> we can start with you, Adam. Okay. Uh, for me, it's uh, definitely where the love started. It's meeting new people. It's working with colleagues and guests and customers and clients alike. Uh, I, I like the interaction. Um, that's uh, that's been true since day one, and it will always be. Uh, but I do like the mix of being in the office, you know, do your doing your planning, all your office work that has to be done, and then getting out in the f floor or getting out and talking with your clients, whether it be for sales or just internal customers. It's it's a good balance, it's a good mix. Uh, it's not one of those jobs where you have to be at your computer the whole entire day and you never leave it. Um, you're, you're out there in the field, which I really enjoy. Uh, but I would say the thing I'm most passionate about and enjoy the most, I would say, is the, the fact that you get to work with so many unique people in the industry. Halifax especially is a very tight hospitality, food and beverage community. And uh, I definitely realized after moving away in the middle of the Rockies where you're three and a half hours from the closest city, being in Halifax, I mean, you know all your winemakers, you know the owners of the vineyards, you know the, the brewmasters and the producers. When you walk down, when I go down to the market now, you know you know most of the people down there that have their, their booths. It's, it's really fun to interact with those people. And you have, when we have uh, um, guests in, we're really providing a memory and experience for them when we can talk to them about all these products that we're so familiar with. And uh, I enjoy creating events with, uh, with these people. Uh, we're, we're working on a winemaker versus brewmaster dinner where I'm going to have the winemaker of Avondale Sky in and Danielle, the brewmaster at Garrison, doing a, a paired five-course dinner, and they're going to be there hosting the event. And those are that's just one of the fun things I get to do in my job is know all these people, and I get to sample all their products, which is a bonus, too. Um, for me, I mean, I feel I'm very fortunate and very lucky that, that I get to work in, a, in an industry sort of within the larger hospitality industry where it's, it's you are helping to educate people, and I find at our museum now in particular, it's it's working in a place that helps parents uh, educate their children, and that sort of this is a lot of and like you say, getting out of the office and being able to go up on the museum floor and see people having that interaction. I mean, it sounds horribly hokey, and I would have not believed this until I had actually seen it. But when you actually, and I think most of you, if you've been to the museum, have seen Gus, uh, our gopher tortoise. He's been with the he's been with the museum for 70 years, and he's 90 years old. And this really does happen, and I'm not making this up, that grandparents come in with their grandchildren and will turn to their grandchild and say, my parents used to bring me to the museum to see Gus. And there is that instant connection. They, the, the child has an instant connection with Gus. They have an instant connection again with their grandparents. And it all happens you know, five feet from where we charge them admission and right inside the front door. Then they go off and have all these other experiences while they're there at the museum. You see. People who have a lifelong fear of snakes, hold a snake, hold a spider, you know, see a T-Rex, uh, you know, things that they never got to think they would get to do and have these sort of life experiences. People who have traveled around the world to see, uh, to come to Halifax for the Titanic and to see Titanic artifacts and, and these things that are sort of intrinsically tied to where we're from that frankly we all take for granted and don't really pay attention to of our own stuff. but. You know, and I will say this now, surrounded by hoteliers, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that it's also really, it's, to me, it's very special to be part of the reason that people come. And I say this, and I don't want to take it the wrong way, but nobody comes to stay in the hotel no, unless, they, unless they are like hotel room collectors or something. And I actually said this at a tie-ins event one time, and I thought I was going to get shunned out of the room, but I was like, you know, people don't come that. for yeah. that. They, they need that, and they need that to be awesome. Uh, while they're here, but really people come for the stuff, you know, they come for for the food and for the seafood and for Lunenburg and hopefully they come for those Titanic artifacts and to see Gus and all those things and to be able to be a part of why people chose to come here and not wherever else they could have gone with their time and to know that you have had like a direct impact that people remember and in some cases may remember forever and quite honestly that to me, like seeing like 
three-year-olds and four-year-olds come around the corner and see that, I don't know if anyone saw a T-Rex named Sue, but to be able to go around the corner and know that they will probably remember that forever is quite, you know, something to really be proud of. and something that I, you know, try to strive for, to keep thinking of what the next big thing will be, to be a part of people's lives. And, and to see it act itself out day after day is really, for me, is really quite special. Great. I'm not sure why I'm in the industry any longer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think at the onset, like, a, you know, going back to my kind of culinary years, the, the, the thing that really kept me excited and interesting was that I was able to create something every day. I was able to create something a little bit different, you know, and then as I moved through the, the organization and I kind of came from back of house into front of house, it was actually seeing that effect on people, being able to see that you've created a bit of an experience for them. Um, I, I do agree. I, I do agree. <laughs> people don't come to stay in hotels. That's absolutely true. But you know what? You can make a difference in their experiences. And so at the onset, you know, the first way you kind of feel that is through that direct feedback with customers. Now it's, it's kind of interesting to me, I, I, you know, we see a lot of customer surveys, we get letters, we get phone calls, you know, that's kind of what I you know, generally deal with when I'm talking about customers. And it's still a lot of fun to hear about how somebody, you know, uh, serving them breakfast who brought over, you know, um, some toys for their you know, kid to play with for a few minutes just made their day, you know. Um, so I find that that's something that, you know, has always felt good throughout my entire career in hospitality and uh, something that I look for every day. The other big thing for me is that I don't think I can ever say I had the same day twice. You know, um, every time I come to work, <laughs> I, I kind of look at my phone and I go, what am I going to deal with today? And sometimes I'm, I'm a little anxious about what I'm going to have to deal with, but more often than not, I'm pretty excited about what we're going to deal with. You know, whether it's the success of the previous night and hearing how everything went for customers, um, or the challenges that we faced with our plumbing, our air conditioning, our heating, or somebody that's Jack built Hammer. something. Or jackhammering, Jack Hammer. yeah, right now, jackhammering. <laughs> Um, it's that sense of, of having something different every day um, that I really appreciate and I find fun. And then the third thing is, is that I don't think I've ever gone through three months uh, where there hasn't been some kind of change taking place in our industry. And some of those changes have been very challenging for us. You know, we've, we've had some fairly big recessions that hit the hospitality industry. Um, but if anything, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, makes you innovate, makes you create. Um, you know, and I do enjoy that part of it as well. And the last thing for me, and, and the only, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I really enjoy Halifax too is it's just the, the staff. It's, you know, it's great that we've got customers, don't, you know, don't get me wrong, can't operate without them, but um, I really enjoy the associates that I work with, um, whether it's the question of the day, whether it's the idea of the day, whether it's just hearing about their lives, it's, it's a nice environment to work in. Uh, and that's one of the things that's special to me. Um, I would say um, what I enjoy most is um, very much along the same lines, and I've put it down as influence and impact. The influence I can have in careers and, and people's choices, and the impact that I've been able to make uh, with our customers and our guests. And those two things, if that turns you on, if that's what does it for you, then um, you're in the right business for sure. If you like to have influence and you like to have impact, then um, that's what I enjoy most. Excellent, thank you all, that's great. And last but not least, before we open up for questions, advice for students entering the field. We will start with Jeff number one, Gray, Jeff Gray. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You got like the number that. one spot too, eh? Right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Trashes my industry and then it gets the number one. That's great. <laughs> I'm, I have two little things and they're morphing into one thing, I think. But I'm, lately I've become quite interested in, in sort of the management and ownership of your own personal brand. And that, that understanding that what that is and, and how the world perceives you, I think especially early out of the gate, is really important, but I think it's important through your whole life. I think that people, you know, people do judge you by what you're wearing or how you're looking, how you carry yourself, and the attitudes that you bring to the table, and and how you perform in groups and in and in, 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 in on management teams. And I think that understanding that and really owning that, I think, is really, I think, it's going to become increasingly important. And I have said this. I think I, my next line. I think I've said that every one of these that I get asked to do is that. Um, 
everyone should early in their career and early in this process can, should do themselves a big favor and buy a good suit. Uh, and I think that people will <laughs> laugh, and I've been laughed at for that, but I now sit on a lot of interview panels, and it is shocking, shocking what comes to you. you know, and where people don't, I'm not saying you know, that that's how it's going to be, and I'm not saying that you're not going to be judged by your, your skills and your resume and what you bring to the table, but if you look disheveled, or you don't look like the place that you are applying to work, that is going to cut you out early on. And I don't, and I don't think that it's a bad investment. Plus, you're going to go to a lot of weddings, and unfortunately a few funerals. <laughs> and if you have it early in the gate, I see it seems like a trivial piece, but I tell this story because it relates to the mount. I, when I was at ECOA, my last work term, I came on a, a recruiting trip to hire my replacement. And we came back to the mount. And I came with my, who was my boss at the time. And we came in, I think, I think we interviewed four people, but I could be wrong. It, it might have been, I don't think it was more than that. We interviewed four people. And we hired none of them. And I'm not even sure if that was the end of the program or what it was, but it was due to the, un, and I, my boss told me, I can't get over how unprofessionally dressed the people that we just interviewed were. Don't they know they're going to work at a, in a government office? You can't come in with, and his big issue was there were skirts that were too short and some blouses that were too short and shirts that were untucked. And it was just, you know, I was embarrassed. I had to sit for three and a half hours back to Charlottetown with him listening to about <laughs> how badly this went. And his big issue was on, on dress. And I think that it was, a, and it was an issue when I worked at, at Disney World. You need to know where you're going and I mean that metaphorically as much as I mean the place that you are interviewing. So if you know that and you match yourself and your demeanor and your and literally your appearance for it, that's going to go a long way. So a good suit. Might seem silly, but I think that it actually helps uh, you think about your own personal brand. I like the, the personal brand. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. I, I, I would say, um, you know, for me, the one thing that I, I would really want people to do is, is don't wait to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Be a leader today. You know, there's so many times where um, we're, we're starting an interview for a promotion and, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about three or four internal candidates and um, somebody's already demonstrated those leadership skills and it really, you know, they, they end up head and shoulders above the rest. Um, and I've heard people say, you know, well, you know, I, I can't lead because I don't have the title to lead. You know, you will, you know, I don't know, the title will never provide you with any kind of magical superpowers that allow you to lead suddenly. You know, you either start practicing that today or, or you won't be able to do it when the time comes. All right? So if you're, you know, if you're a shyer, more introverted, quieter person, that doesn't mean you can't lead. It just means you're going to have to find a way to kind of get your voice heard when you need to. And frankly, if you're always kind of the only one speaking in the room, you probably need to learn to let somebody else do some of the talking as well, because that's part of leadership too. And, and leader, leading has changed so much. I mean, um, I, I think about 25 years ago, leadership meant that you gave orders, and it was an autocratic process to get people to do what you wanted. And today, it's, it's about how you inspire people to do what you want, because they're going to do it when you're not in the room, right? And that's the only way you're going to get that action from them. So. So I would just, you know, I'd really want people to think about that. I would also say that, um, you know, there's a, a, a tradition in hotels anyway where the general manager always stems from the front office. You know, that, that's been for years how they, you know, generally have been recruited into uh, GM's positions. And that's changing, you know. Um, I would just suggest to you guys that there's plenty of ways to get wherever you want. There isn't just one avenue to take. I mean, uh, I know plenty of people that uh, have entered the f industry and said, look, I want to become a general manager one day. And they're working at corporate, doing a different role entirely, but that's the path that they found. Um, so be open to different paths. You know, don't be afraid to go and do that one job that, you know, you may have kind of said in your mind, I don't think I'll like it. Um, but that job could be something that gets you noticed and gets you to the next position. You know, oftentimes in hotels, in, in my company, you know, some of the positions that open up aren't the ones that people want to laterally move to. Make a lateral move. Lateral moves are great. You know, it broadens your kind of base. You know, there's, uh, you know, the bigger the base, the better the pyramid, the, the higher you'll go kind of thing. So, but again, it's just, it is about making sure that you perform and everything. So, that's my thoughts. Great, thanks.
Um, advice, um, if you're going to do it, do it well. Or don't do it at all. Whatever you do, no matter how big or how small it is, do it well. And I, I tell you this story only because um, I had a graduate come and want to be a, like a Girl Friday, if you will, just an extra in the sales office, and this is many, many years ago. And uh, she had a degree, and she was very smart, and, and uh, she, she was much more than what the position needed, but it was her way in. And I thought, you know what, that's okay. It's your way in, you want to do this, you're overqualified, but you know, this is great. And one of the things we did is when the bus tours used to come, we'd have chocolate lobsters. There were pink chocolate lobsters in little baggies. And every one of those had to be slipped into a bag and then tied with a ribbon at the top. Now we used to do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tours um, in the run of a month and 12 buses, 50 people a bus every night. It was amazing the amount of business that we used to do in the tour market. And this girl, one of her duties as that extra was to put the chocolate lobster in the bag and tie the ribbon. Well, that worked for about the first week. And then you could never find her, she was never there, we always ran out of chocolate lobsters, and, and so on goes the story. And I can remember one day we had an, an opening, and she really wanted that opening. And she was qualified, if you will, for that opening, but she didn't deserve that opening. Because whatever you do, you do it the very best you can do it. And I remember calling her into my office and saying, until you're the best pink chocolate lobster ribbon tying person, I have, you don't get to be that person over there. So my advice, if you're going to do it, be the best at it, as do it as well as you can. Be driven, be committed, um, and be positive. It is so easy to talk about having a bad hair day, not enough money, you know, runs in your pantyhose, whatever your issues are. Um, or when I ask you, how was your day today in an interview, instead of telling me all that stuff, tell me how great it is to be at my hotel or at my place of business and interviewing for a job. I can't tell you how many people blow that question. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. What's that? I'm fine. What's fine? <laughs> Right? So be positive. That's what it's all about. Be positive. Work harder than anyone else because you know what? Not all of us have got the smarts, right? I'm up here with a lot of smart people. We've got sommeliers and we've got Cornell universities and we've got museum people. Geez, what do I know about a museum? But I'll tell you. Oh, I know. You, what does what Jeff know? No. Um, but work hard. Be the hardest worker. Be the person, as Adam said to be there late, stay late, do whatever it takes. That's my advice, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Adam? Uh, my advice when entering the field, uh, I know it, it worked for myself, was uh, to think long-term, always keep your, your goals in mind, and to think long-term, because um, go, going out into this industry when you first graduate, the big, huge, money-making job, if you thought that was coming right out of school, it's, n it's not your first step. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process. And some of the entry level supervisory management positions out there in the industry, you're, you're making less than your servers that are working for you after they make their tips at the end of the day. And I've seen it go both ways. Those who are engaged and thinking about their career and knowing where they want to go and knowing what they're doing and how it's going to get them there, they, they stay motivated and that doesn't affect them. They know the growth they're, they're seeing personally, not financially every day that will get them to the next step that will pay more. Um, I, whenever I promoted anyone from a, a server to a supervisor, for example, you know, if they're qualified and, and all the rest, I want to make sure that they're okay with, with taking that step back financially starting out. If they were making, you know, 100, 150 bucks a day before in tips, you're not going to, if you average it out, your hours and your salary, you'd be discouraged unless you're thinking about your career. So think long term. Don't let that discourage you. Stay motivated. And, uh, you know, make sure that if you work for, uh, for a good company, they'll know, 
your goals and they'll be talking to you and working on those with you but if you're working in a place and they're not taking the time to ask you what you want to learn what your next step is where you want to be where you want to go uh, ask them if you can do a development plan with them um, you know sit down with them and, and kind of talk about what you want to learn and maybe how they can help you with that make sure your supervisor knows what, what you want to do um, don't keep it to yourself and, and make sure you're working towards that each and every day Excellent, thank you all. And now, questions from the crowd, if there are any. 